Saturn's stupendous supply of small space spheres is a more interesting way of saying Saturn's moons, although it is only two-thirds accurate. Saturn has 82 known moons, the most of any planet, and 60 of them are less than 20 kilometers in diameter, which for something in space is tiny. The inaccurate part is that only a few of these moons are spherical, the rest look something like potatoes. This video is about some of the more interesting of these moons. And if you're wondering how interesting a bunch of space potato moons can be, here is a picture of a Death Star look-alike, with an equatorial mountain range twice as tall as Mount Everest and a hemisphere-sized dirt stain from another moon. First up are the Shepherd moons Pan and Daphnis, both of which are only a few kilometers across. Shepherd moons are moons that orbit in or near planetary rings that keep the rings in place. For example, Pan's gravity creates a gap in Saturn's A ring, known as the NK gap. Any material that collects in this gap either gets collected by Pan as it passes or pushed away from the gap back into the surrounding rings. Pan and Daphnis orbit very closely to Saturn, inside the innermost part of its rings. The dust that Pan has collected from the NK gap has piled up into a large ridge. Because of this ridge, Pan has been nicknamed the Ravioli Moon. Like everything in space, Daphnis's orbit isn't exactly circular. It is slightly elongated and tilted relative to Saturn. However, Daphnis's orbit is unusually close to circular, with the long axis only being a few kilometers wider than the short one, and the orbital inclination, or tilt, is only three thousandths of a degree. This means that Daphnis spends most of its time very close to the rings, but still a few kilometers above or below them. Since the rings are just very loose dust, they're very susceptible to being moved by larger objects around them. And since Daphnis is usually only a few kilometers away from the rings, the dust gets gravitationally pulled towards Daphnis. Since Daphnis and the rings around it are slightly different distances from Saturn, they move past each other. So each speck of dust is only near Daphnis for a short amount of time before it moves away. This relative velocity, combined with Saturn's gravity pulling the dust back into place, is what causes the waves to seemingly expand away from Daphnis in a ripple shape. Even though these waves are amazing to look at on their own, they get even cooler twice every Saturnian year. The waves stick out vertically, and just before and after Saturn's equinoxes, during which Saturn's equator, and also the rings, are angled exactly zero degrees to the sun, the waves cast shadows on the rings behind them, resulting in pictures like this. If you thought Pan looked silly, Atlas is straight up ludicrous. Unlike Pan, Atlas is not a shepherd moon, but it is still very close to the edge of one of Saturn's rings. Because it is much larger than Pan, Atlas has picked up far more material from the nearby ring. So much material that it's created an equatorial ridge so large that Atlas is over twice as wide at the equator than at the poles. From certain angles, it almost looks like a fried egg. The height of this ridge is equal to Atlas's Roche lobe. This means that if it were any taller, the centrifugal force from Atlas's rotation would overcome Atlas's gravitational force and cause material to fly outward into space off the moon. Not content with just this weirdness, Atlas also has a very, very, very small ring around it. It's too faint to be seen from any large distance, so I don't have any pictures of it, but it is there. Janus is named after the Roman god of doorways, who had two faces. This is a rather appropriate name given its history. In the 1960s, astronomers had detected and identified a large object in orbit around Saturn. There was just one problem. A few years later, some different astronomers successfully got the three consecutive measurements needed to accurately calculate an orbit, an orbit nearly 50 kilometers from where Janus had initially been detected. It seemed as if there were two moons in nearly the same orbit that looked similar, both pretending to be the same moon. Two moons, one face. 
It took several decades to fully work out the orbital dynamics of Janus and its companion, Epimetheus. The two moons orbit 50 to 60 kilometers from each other, and since the inner moon is slightly closer to Saturn, it has a smaller distance to travel, making it complete its orbit around 30 seconds faster. In a little over four years, the inner moon will complete one more orbit than the outer moon, catching up to it from behind. Once the two moons get close enough, the outward, forward moon begins pulling the inner, backward moon towards it, and vice versa. Both moons essentially pull the other into their orbit, while taking the other's original orbit. In reality, they don't quite switch places. Janus only moves about 20 kilometers in or out, while Epimetheus moves nearly 80 kilometers, since it's only a quarter of the size. Mimas is 400 kilometers across, making it by far the largest moon so far. It's almost 11 times the volume of Janus. Mimas is also the smallest Saturnian moon for which I have a detailed surface map, which is what allows for this rotating model. The most special thing about Mimas is that it is the smallest body in the solar system to be spherical because of its own gravity. Smaller objects like Daphnis or Janus have enough gravity to be rounded, but they're still lumpy and uneven, while Mimas is roughly spherical. Mimas is, however, not fully rounded. It still has large differences in elevation relative to its size, and it is also not in hydrostatic equilibrium. This means that the force of gravity from Mimas's mass and the pressure from the material it's made of isn't balanced. You can think of this like a glass of ice cubes. All the pieces of ice are resting on each other, so none of them are moving. But if you shake the glass, it can settle into a denser arrangement, and the top of the ice is at a lower level of the glass. We are now finally beyond the rings of Saturn. There are more rings orbiting Saturn past this point, but they're all of different origins and compositions, and they're visually distinct, so it makes sense to call them something else. One of those additional outer rings is from the moon Enceladus. If you've seen a picture of one of Saturn's moons, there's a good chance it was Enceladus. The moon is easily the flashiest of Saturn's moons. Literally, it's made of ice. Enceladus's surface can be thought of as a giant glacier. There's no rock on the surface of the moon. Instead, there are layers of ice, which make it the most reflective, and thus relative to its size, brightest moon in the solar system. Being so reflective also means that very little light is absorbed, making the surface of Enceladus incredibly cold, helping to maintain the frozen state of the ice. Enceladus's ice isn't completely frozen, however. Enceladus and the nearby moon Dione orbit in a 2 to 1 resonance, which means that their orbits are gravitationally locked, such that Enceladus orbits exactly twice in the same time Dione orbits once. This resonance has the side effect of stretching Enceladus's orbit, which causes strong tidal forces from Saturn. These, combined with more minor tidal forces from Dione, and some other moons, causes Enceladus to be stretched and squeezed. Friction from this stretching and squeezing heats up the inside of Enceladus. And while you might not think of friction as something that can create a lot of heat, when a small force is multiplied by the mass of a moon-sized snowball, you get a moon's worth of heat, melting the inside of Enceladus, creating a subterranean ocean, or maybe a subglacial ocean. This ocean is several kilometers below the surface, and likely envelops most of Enceladus. The region that we can see this ocean have the most direct effect on is the southern hemisphere of Enceladus which has massive rifts and fault lines, a result of the ice being moved by tidal forces and sliding around on top of the ocean. The tidal forces also heat up the rocky core of Enceladus, creating small geothermal hotspots similar to those on the ocean floors of Earth. These geothermal vents are one of the places that might have chemicals similar to the ones that maybe led to some form of early life on Earth 3 billion years ago. In my script, the previous sentence is partially italicized, to make sure I use the right tone to convey just how little we know about the chemistry of Enceladus's ocean, and how speculative any conversation of life is, particularly on a moon that constantly blasts its insides out into space. These are the cryovolcanic geysers of Enceladus, and while Enceladus isn't the only moon that has these, no other moon in the solar system has them quite on the same scale. 
These plumes are likely the result of particularly concentrated heat near the South Pole, resulting in more warmer water and larger geothermal vents. The vents heat up the water, which then makes its way through fissures in the ice, and then when it reaches the vacuum of space, it vaporizes, then freezes back into ice. Some of it even turns into snow. Some of the ice falls back to Enceladus, constantly coating it in a fresh layer of bright ice to keep the outside of the moon very, very cold, while the rest of it escapes Enceladus and forms the additional ring that I talked about earlier. If you've ever seen this amazing picture of Saturn taken by the Cassini spacecraft, that bright, fuzzy, outermost halo is the Enceladus ring, also known as the E-ring. Based off measurements of the E-ring, and estimates of the rate at which Enceladus vents its oceans out, it has been estimated that Enceladus's geysers have removed about a third of the original mass of the moon from when it formed. This loss of material and the resulting constant shifting of mass inside Enceladus may be responsible for exacerbating the tectonic activity caused by tidal forces. While Enceladus has an ocean hidden below kilometers of ice, there's another Saturnian moon with an ocean right at its surface that, ironically, we know even less about. It's time for the one unique moon in the solar system, Titan. Enceladus may have an ocean, but so do Europa and Tethys. Io may have an atmosphere, but so does Triton. What makes Titan special is that it is the only moon in the solar system that has stable liquid on its surface. Titan, true to its name, is a giant. It's the second largest moon in the solar system, with just under 1.5 times the diameter of Earth's moon, and nearly twice the mass. This puts it closer in size to the planet Mars than to our moon. Titan is shrouded by a dense atmosphere made primarily of nitrogen, the same gas that makes up most of Earth's atmosphere. And that's where the direct similarities end. Despite being much smaller than Earth, Titan has a denser and heavier atmosphere. At the surface, Titan's air pressure is 1.45 times that of Earth, and this is in spite of the much weaker gravity. Overall, Titan's atmosphere is about one and a quarter times the mass of Earth's, but only spread over an area a fifth the size. Titan's atmosphere is so dense that when combined with its weak gravity, about one-seventh that of Earth's, a human with cardboard taped to their arms could fly. The atmosphere also has clouds made of methane and ethane, which is the cause of the hazy yellow appearance. The methane in the upper atmosphere of Titan gets broken down and recombined into more complex organic chemicals by ultraviolet light from the sun. Measurements of this transformation suggest that all of the methane in Titan's atmosphere would be exhausted in just 50 million years, but Titan has existed for at least 4 billion years, meaning that the methane is constantly replenished. The likely explanation is that Titan is geologically active, and the methane is released from Titan's interior, similar to how volcanoes on Earth release small amounts of CO2 during eruptions. This dense atmosphere is the reason Titan can have liquids on its surface. The sheer mass of the atmosphere helps trap a lot of heat, making Titan's surface relatively warm, and the high air pressure allows for liquids to be stable at lower temperatures. Most of the liquid resides in lakes near Titan's poles, where the more stable temperature allows large amounts of ethane and methane to collect. These liquids are dense enough that similarly to how a human can fly on just muscle power on Titan, one could potentially walk on the surface of these lakes. The largest lake on Titan is the Kraken Mare near the North Pole. The Kraken Mare has an area of 500,000 square kilometers, or a little bit larger than the Caspian Sea. Nearby is the Ligaea Mare, which is roughly one quarter the size. Ligaea Mare and Kraken Mare are connected by a channel. Despite this, Ligaea Mare is nearly 100% methane, while Kraken Mare is a mixture of methane and ethane. Even more confusingly, most of the other smaller lakes have more ethane than methane. Titan does have something analogous to a water cycle. A hydrocarbon cycle, maybe? During the summers of each hemisphere, material evaporates off the lakes, collecting the atmosphere above Titan's equator. When winter comes again, methane and ethane rain back down to the surface, 
and then eventually flow towards and collect in the polar lakes. Because the tilt and eccentricity of Saturn's orbit, and also all of its moons, line up to make the winter longer and colder in the northern hemisphere of Titan, most of the lakes are near the North Pole, with only 1 in 30 being at the South Pole. Titan is also the farthest object that humans have sent a spacecraft to the surface of, the Huygens lander brought along by the Cassini spacecraft. When Huygens landed on the surface of Titan, it took this picture, showing the surface of Titan covered in what look like rocks that are actually chunks of ice. I'm now finally out of things I can say about Titan without involving math, so it's time for Titan's spongy little neighbor. This one is weird. Hyperion is one of the largest irregularly shaped moons in the solar system. Its average radius is 135 kilometers, although that obviously isn't the whole story for a moon twice as wide as it is long. Hyperion can be so large and so non-spherical because it has very low density. Despite being one-third the volume of Mimas, one of the smallest spherical moons, it has less than a sixth the mass, giving it half the density of Mimas. The reason for this very low density is not known, although it is known that Hyperion is made of very loosely packed material, almost more of a gravel pile than a moon. But even then, Hyperion is an unusually lightweight moon. In addition to being loose, the material inside Hyperion is unevenly distributed, giving the moon a chaotic rotation and orbit. Its orbit is also shoved around by Titan. The inner and outer points of Hyperion's orbit slowly move along Hyperion's orbital path. This chaotic rotation and ever-changing orbit give Hyperion another standout feature, in that its surface is nearly all the same, all over the moon. This is because Hyperion isn't locked, with one side always facing Saturn, meaning that one side isn't always facing into the orbital path to collect dust and debris. That, however, is very untrue for the next moon on the list. And you might recognize this one, since Iapetus is the dirt-stained Death Star look-alike that I mentioned in the intro. Iapetus's crater is surrounded by large cliffs, the result of giant ice slides which have also flattened the crater itself into a basin. Iapetus is also the home of the second monolith in the book 2001 A Space Odyssey. It was chosen since the brown stripe across the leading hemisphere makes it look something like a giant eye, and the author wanted the symbolism of the monolith looking at Earth. The mountain range at the equator is of unknown origin, but one of the more fun and plausible ideas is that Iapetus had a ring system earlier in its existence. A ring system could have been easily gravitationally disrupted by the orbits of Phoebe and Titan, as those moons settled into their current positions. And once enough of the rings had been disrupted, the rest would have been knocked out of orbit by collisions with other ring material. This is just one theory alongside many others, although one of the better supported ones. Most of the other theories involve tidal forces in some way, usually from Phoebe. Phoebe was not always a moon of Saturn. That much is certain. For one, it orbits four times as far away from Saturn as, and is the only large object past Iapetus. Number two, it orbits backwards. All of the moons discussed so far, and nearly all of the ones I haven't mentioned, orbit counterclockwise, the same direction Saturn rotates in. Phoebe orbits clockwise, and at a massive 30 degree angle relative to Saturn and the rest of its moons. Three, it's literally a comet. Phoebe occasionally has a trail of ice and dust particles, the same as many other comets in the outer solar system. It was likely a centaur comet, orbiting between the Kuiper and asteroid belts, that got captured by Saturn. Phoebe is responsible for the largest ring around Saturn, made of the material from Phoebe's comet trail and debris from micrometeorite collisions. This ring, named the Phoebe Ring, is the origin of the giant brown spot on Iapetus. Rings are inherently unstable, and constantly lose material to the gravity of their parent planet. Iapetus is close enough to the edge of the Phoebe Ring that it intercepts a lot of the falling dust. I've talked several times now about unstable rings or orbits causing spectacular things to happen around Saturn, but this last moon was the most unstable and is now the most spectacular of all of Saturn's moons. This moon is somewhere in between the size of Mimas and Titan, made of either mostly ice like Iapetus or mostly rock like Titan. We finally got into the moon Veritas, better known as the Rings of Saturn.
Any planetary ring system has a very finite and unstable lifespan, and the larger the ring, the more unstable it is. Because of this instability, we probably won't be able to figure out the exact age of the rings until we've seen them be destroyed, and what they looked like at the end of their lifespan. Similarly to how the Phoebe ring constantly loses material to both the gravity of Saturn and collisions with itself, Saturn's rings lose material, and they do it much faster. All of Saturn's moons have some gravitational effect on the rings. Some of them, like Pan, Epimetheus, and Enceladus, are helpful, keeping the ring material in one place. Others, like Atlas, Titan, and especially Phoebe, shove material around in the rings, making it clump up, then fall apart again, or just crashing it into other ring material, or sometimes just pulling material off the rings entirely. Saturn also isn't helping. The magnetosphere of Saturn is strong enough to see under the right conditions, and the static electricity it generates through interacting with the rings causes material to be pulled towards Saturn, an effect called ring rain. When the Cassini spacecraft passed in between Saturn and the innermost part of the rings in 2017, it measured the rate of this loss of material, from which it was estimated that the rings may be gone in just 100 million years. This measurement alone does not allow one to figure out the age of the rings, but it's not the only measurement we can take. As they age, rings intercept more and more micrometeorites, collecting them as a new part of the ring. This makes rings darker over time, but Saturn's rings are really bright. There are two main explanations for this. Either the outermost part of the rings are large enough to block enough of the micrometeorite impacts to keep the rest of the rings clean, or the rings are only about 100 million years old. If the first explanation is correct, then the rings are probably about a billion years old, and were once much, much larger. It is even possible that the moon Rhea, one of the few large rocky moons of Saturn, formed out of the outer part of the rings, which would explain why there is so little silicate rock in them. If the second explanation is correct, then the rings we see now are an abnormal and temporary decoration, and once they're gone, Saturn will have only had its current rings for about 1 20th of its history. Regardless of which theory, or which of the endless variations of these theories is correct, we know that Saturn's rings are nowhere near the age of the planet itself, which brings us to what little we know of their origin, a moon informally but commonly referred to as Veritas. Because we don't know the exact age or original composition of the rings, we don't know how large Veritas was or what it was made of, so we don't really know anything about it. What we can say with some certainty is how it went from a moon to a pretty disk of rubble. We've talked about how moons like Enceladus experience strong tidal forces from their parent planet. Since tidal forces are a result of gravitational forces, it makes sense that the closer a moon gets to a planet, and its gravity gets stronger, the tidal forces from it also get stronger. Actually, that isn't quite correct. Tidal forces are a result of both, gravity pulling something towards a planet down, and also different parts of a planet trying to orbit at different speeds, due to being different distances from the source of gravity. The closer you get to the source of gravity, the stronger it pulls down, and the greater the relative difference between the farthest and closest parts of a moon are. All this combined means that as a moon gets closer to a planet, the tidal forces on it become stronger. Really strong. Strong enough to pull even a large moon to pieces. In fact, the larger the moon, the farther it can be from the planet and still be torn apart, since the large size of the moon also means a large difference in force felt by the parts closest and farthest from the planet. The area inside which one object orbiting another can be torn apart like this is called the Roche limit, and you'll never find a large moon inside this boundary. Several of Saturn's small moons, including Pan, Daphnis, and Atlas, are inside Saturn's Roche limit, but they're small and dense enough to stay in one piece. Veritas would have formed farther out, and then likely through gravitational interaction with other moons, slowly moved closer and closer towards Saturn. Once it got near the Roche limit, it slowly fell apart and eventually either disintegrated completely or fell into Saturn. The debris would have spread out, with some of the material getting eaten up by other moons until the material was spread out into a ring system. Whether or not the rings are a billion years old or just a mere 100 million, Saturn's rings are not the normal for the gas giant. They appeared from the destruction of a moon, and Saturn is slowly finishing off the leftovers. It is entirely possible, though, that another planet will find itself with a large ring system at some point. 
Jupiter alone has 79 moons, and their orbits are especially chaotic. It's entirely possible that one of Jupiter's four giant moons will fling a smaller one towards the planet. In fact, Jupiter already has a small ring system, although it's more like the Phoebe ring than a proper flat disk you can see easily. Mars's moon Phobos is slowly spiraling in towards the planet, and is so loose that it might get pulled apart into a ring despite its small size. Neptune's moon Triton is also slowly heading towards its parent planet, and is definitely large enough to make a ring system potentially one even larger than what Saturn has now. And, Neptune's current ring system is collecting to a group of tiny moons quickly enough that it'll be gone by the time Triton falls apart, so Neptune will be ringless for a while. Pan, Daphnis, Atlas, Janus, Epimetheus, Mimas, Enceladus, Titan, Hyperion, Iapetus, and Phoebe, 11 moons out of 82. Out of all of them, these are the ones that I think are the most interesting and entertaining, and I hope you enjoyed this video bouncing around in between them. But there are 71 more moons I haven't mentioned. There are 71 more worlds I haven't mentioned.